when we start looking back a little bit into human history, we find a tendency that continues and revives itself constantly over the course of ages. When, by circumstances, largely due to ourselves, we get into difficulties which we cannot control and for which we have no practical solution, there is always the same tendency to turn back again to the basic faith of our people or our race. This is a time when this type of situation is being re-emphasized. In the last five years, the increase of religious interest has been phenomenal, and it is increasing constantly with new and more important and more interesting contributions arriving every day. Actually, however, in the past where we've had this type of experience, we have tried desperately to accomplish a particular good and have had great problems trying to accomplish that which we hope for. A word may be at this time would be interesting in connection with the life and labors of William Penn, the Quaker. William Penn founded what he termed, or established what he termed, the Holy Experiment. This experiment was the result of gaining a grant, a grant of land in the Western Hemisphere and building there what is now the state of Pennsylvania. But the holy experiment was to establish a free and independent state without an army, without war, without a militia, without treaties, and without any violence or persecution, with personal liberty of thought and complete equality of religion. Now this is what he came over here to do. And it worked for 76 years, just about the way he planned it. It worked because he started in, probably, with the first remarks that are re recorded re relating him to the King of England. He came to the King of England to have a grant, and it was given to him. And as was usual in those days, to gain a territorial grant had some expenses involved in it. There had to be a payment to the crown. So when Penn was ready to leave, he made a short visit to the king, and the king wished him well. And he said, what are you going to do when you get over there? Penn said, the first thing I'm going to do is buy the land from the Indians. Well, he says, you've already bought it from me. He said, we don't count that, sire. We don't count any payment until it is paid to the rightful owners. <laughs> that was way back in the 17th century. And it started that way, and went along that way. And in all the years of Penn's life and his direct descendants, there was never a day of trouble with the Indians. While all the other colonies were in grave danger, they had made treaties, they made them, and they kept them. And the success of this experiment resulted in something else. Many, many persecuted groups in England, Germany, Poland, and the northern states, finding a possible place where they could worship God according to the conviction of their own conscience, came and settled within Payne's domain. And Penn was the one who accepted them all, cherished them all, and gave not one of them authority to dominate a completely temperate religious atmosphere. Now this was an, a holy experiment, he called it that. And it worked for a, quite a long while. And what destroyed it? What brought it to an end? The increasing complexity of colonization, the constant squabbling in other areas, and the gradual intensification of economic policies the desire for territory, for sale and building of towns and cities, 
Little by little, the control slipped away from Pennsylvania. But for a long time, it worked. And today, I think we are all standing on the verge of the need for another holy experiment. Something to prove that problems can be solved without violence, without dishonesty, without propaganda, and without interference on the rights of the individual to think, and to establish still in this world a commonwealth in which the primary purpose is that all persons should have security of thought and life. So all this happened nearly 300 years ago. And it is something we can bring with us, I think, perhaps, to a little thought on this Easter Sunday morning. And here we are confronted uh, with a word in the Bible, and occurring in the, particularly the use I want to make of it, in the third chapter of Proverbs. And that is the word righteousness. Now, righteousness doesn't appear in that verse, but the concept behind it appears in it. And this verse says, referring to wisdom. The length of life is in her right hand, honors and riches in her left hand. Now, in our modern world, we've been dealing pretty heavily with the left hand of God, but we haven't been quite so thoughtful of the right hand. Now, righteousness comes from the word right, and uh, when we study that word, not only in spelling and pronunciation, but in all its usages and division, divisions of usage, we find that it is a very remarkable world and word. In the biblical sense of it, righteousness means rightness. And rightness in the Bible means obedience. Obedience to the laws of God and the laws of nature. Obedience is therefore the basis of right living right thinking, right hoping, right building, right planning. And all these things must be governed by a power superior to man. When the human being tries to take this over and run it himself, he gets into trouble. He has always gotten into trouble, and the trouble has always continued until the human being becomes aware that there are rules that he cannot break and that the rules that he makes live only to the degree that they obey the rules of life and nature. So gradually by degrees we get into a left-handed situation in which wealth and honor and power take control of conduct and as a result of that empires, nations, races, communities fall apart, and in their fall bring down the individual with his small but significant problems. Now what are the laws with which we must learn ultimately to work? They are the laws that are expressing themselves constantly in every aspect of existence as we see it. I've been much interested recently in a number of nature films that have been shown on television in which we find definite indications of the rudimentary, rudimentary principles of universal law. Many of these rules are difficult for us to understand, but we know that creatures comparatively humble and with practically no intelligence as we know it are able to fulfill destinies which have been established by powers superior to themselves. Therefore, living or existing is very largely a problem of fulfilling destiny, to continue the thing as it should be, to do the work that is next, and to keep on striving for the ultimate good, which is universal security. This is the problem that we face, and it has been in many ways distorted and disabled by human uh, activities. Now, today science is hard at work solving all kinds of wonderful mysteries of nature. We are out looking into the galaxy for this and into the inner parts of the earth for something else. We are experimenting, building, contriving, conspiring. 
uh, to enlarge the frame of human domination over life. But the principle is wrong. We are not here to dominate life, we are here to fulfill life. Because life itself is something we do not control, do not understand, and are not in any immediate danger of solving as a problem. <laughs> we are here to fulfill the purpose of humanity. And this is clearly set forth in most of the biblical writings of both the Old and the New Testaments that we are here to do what we ought to do and not just what we want to do. If we break the rules, either from ignorance or from perversity of temperament, we are going to be in trouble. And as we have been breaking these rules regularly for thousands of years. Things get worse. Problems increase and multiply and knowledge expanding towards the solution of material things ends in a spiritual and intellectual disaster. We are here, therefore, to say, say that science has to make certain changes in its perspectives. It is charming and wonderful to develop and perfect computers. It is a delightful problem to examine the ashes of the past and sift the sands of Babylon. It is well very happy to go out and explore the habits of bugs and birds. But if these explorations and these researches do not contribute to the solution of the human problem, we are wasting a lot of time which we do not have available to waste much longer. Therefore, the problem in every matter is to find out the full meaning of righteousness and that each individual must attain a state of righteousness. Now, one of the basic meanings of righteousness is to be right, to be what we should be. And what is rightness? According to religion, and for that matter, morality and ethics, and almost all of the great philosophical systems, to be right means that cheerfully, lovingly, and happily we keep the rules by which our kind can perpetuate itself. We have to keep the rules. If we keep these rules, they will keep us. If we break them, the broken rules will break us. Now, all knowledge, all learning, all study, all thought should involve some lesson, some participation, in the large policy of the things we need to know, the discoveries we should be making, and the problems we should be solving. Also in the biblical sense of the word, righteousness means according to the will of God. Now God is an abstract term which man has created uh, to, to distinguish the great universal conscious intelligent physical energy, the divine power, the divine realities behind all of the manifestations of creation. In other words, somewhere at the root of things is that which is eternal, that which also has rules that are unbreakable. When men say they break the law, what they really say is they are breaking themselves. Because the lawbreaker says, I have a stomachache. That doesn't mean he broke the law. The disobedience to it damaged his stomach. The law goes on. No one breaks it, but those who try to break themselves against it as against a rock. Now this law sounds kind of formidable. It sounds as though it's going to take all the joy out of life. And that is where theology got into some difficulties. Theology gradually obsessed the human being with a sense of sin that has bothered him and perverted his attentions for a long time. According to theology, most of it, uh, uh, virtue was a matter of continual and eternal frustration. The individual was expected to do everything he did not like to do for the glory of God. Also that he was to be miserable for the sake of his own eternal soul. And that he was to live in constant fear of sin 
and create institution after institution to protect him from sin on the assumption that everything except his own belief was sin. We got very complicated, very unpleasant, and very inadequate. Today we are beginning to recover from some of this, but we still have an idea that that which is good is unpleasant. And why it is unpleasant, if we think for a moment, is that some of the things that we believe to be good are not good. Uh, alcoholism is not good, but for many persons it is a principal reason for living, and as a result of that is the first cause of dying. All the intemperances which the individual considers to be his prime enjoyments are in some way in conflict with reality. So instead of making him a happy, healthy person, they destroy his life, break his home, can, uh, pervert his children, and leave him in the end a sickly and miserable disaster. And yet he is certain that he has the right, um, an inalienable right, to make any mistake that he wishes to without sad consequences for himself. Well, nature just isn't built that way, either divine nature or human nature. Happiness, as we know it, is very largely a matter of dissipation. It is a matter of doing what we please and fulfilling our ambitions, going out of our way, if necessary, to be unpleasant to others, competitive, and often morally dishonest, and that the final virtue of life is the accumulation of wealth or the accumulation of honors and recognitions, not for our realities, but for, for our physical compromises with truth. Now, this just doesn't seem to be working. A lot of people do not know why it isn't working. They don't see any reason why their own conduct should react on them. They f believe that they are entitled to universal divine spoilage. <laughs> they should do as they please, and an all-forgiving parent overlook everything. Well, when we do that in a family, we're in trouble. When nations do it, they are in difficulties. And when the whole human race tries to do it, we have catastrophe. Actually, there is no reason or right in the belief that uh, we have a right to make mistakes. We have the ability to make them, but that does not make a right before nature. If we make mistakes, we pay for them. And as the, we look back over history, we seem to realize that for the last 10 or 15,000 years, we have been paying heavily for something. And the only thing we can be paying for is our own mistakes. Therefore, in this uh, particular period, we must come back to this idea of righteousness. As it is found in the Bible, and was very well established as a term with particular and definite meanings. Righteousness is therefore the condition of being right. It is always the fact that the individual, under all conditions, chooses to be right in every possible way. Now there are uh, problems that arise. Nine people out of ten will tell you they do not know what is right that they are drifting along on guesses and assumptions and speculations and reading the latest works on the subject by unqualified authors. The question remains is, what is right? Well, I think Lord Bacon gave us a valuable key to this. He said, if you want to know really what is right, see what happens as a result of what you do. If you are in trouble, and you look back and you find that you have acted in an unfriendly manner. If you have tried to deceive someone or exploit someone or make unreasonable profits or try to force your own opinions upon others, these are the causes of personal unpleasantness and unhappiness. So if you are right, you are going to have what is probably the most important of all rewards the reward of right is security. Security in a cheerful, 
conscious, intelligent, reasonable way. The right to enjoy life rather than to destroy it at its roots. The right to grow, the right to be happy, to establish proper homes, to live in peace, to have the necessities of life. All of these are right and they are attainable. If public mind and public thinking can ever recognize that right is keeping faith with realities and not the accumulation of worldly goods at mutual expense. So we have now the trying to find out, we are trying to find out a little more about the word righteous. Now in the religion we have another problem. We have for the most part taken it for granted that salvation was due to the faith in which you are born or the creed or culture except by voluntary uh, acceptance of belief. In other words, salvation is the result of membership. Salvation is the result of building between you and your own conduct a kind of upholstery by means of which you are saved in spite of yourself. You are saved by a what uh, Voltaire called a handful of water on that occiput. If uh, you are immersed submerged or sprinkled, you are in religion. Now the original word, use of the word baptism was very simple. It was washing. It was being clean. And it is still so in many religious groups. And a baptism is mean a, meaning a cleansing, a change of self, a complete revision of their own code of life. The, the dedication to righteousness, a dedication to doing those things which are of the common good to all, a determination to hurt no one, a, term, a determination to put common good above self-interest, and most of all, an immediate recognition of the importance of forgiving completely and with open heart those who have despitefully used us. Without the works, the words are useless. So all around the world today, religion is gaining ground. Nearly every nation is becoming involved, and half of this religiously involved world is at war with itself. In the name of religion, people are torturing and tormenting themselves, destroying each other, and trying desperately to exploit each other under the name of religion to build purchase, uh, palaces for themselves instead of a happy world for deity. Thus we find that something is wrong in, the, uh, in righteousness, and the righteousness seems to tell us the answer, that when we claim a religion, it will do us no good unless we live it. If it does not stimulate an improvement of self, and an improvement of the inner life of the individual. The right hand gives us length of life and the power to live, but the left hand gives us only honors and riches, which are of this world only, and are very treacherous things. So in ancient times, all good deeds were performed with the right hand. We shake hands with the right hand. We perform most of the common purposes of life with the right hand because most people are right-handed. Then now we find the necessary step is not just to be right-handed but right-hearted, to understand that there are many labors that have to be performed correctly only by the hand of righteousness, the hand that is set forth for friendship. And while we are thinking about it, we must remember that we cannot afford to shake a man's right hand with ours and have our hands behind our back holding a gun. This type of thing is, is giving us a lot of trouble. And every day the world is coming closer to something. It is coming closer to the realization that in the great emergency there is nothing that will solve it for us but the internal experience of the divine will and the hope of perfection through keeping the words, works, and labors of divinity. We can do it. 
Now some will say, how can we do it? We can do it first of all within the range of the available. And here we can take a very uh, useful little lesson from Buddhism. And that is that it is possible to take the first step. We must take it alone. It cannot be done because society has built a marvelous defense so that if we fall on our faces in the first step, society is going to pick us up. The first step of human development toward realities must be taken by the person with only one f f hope in his heart, and that is hope itself. The hope that to do it right will result in good. This hope seems to be pretty well justified. We have martyred nearly all the people who were really very right. But long after they are gone, they are the heroes of humanity. They are the saints and gods and, and sages that we honor most in life, are the ones we had no time for while they were alive. Because we didn't understand then the need for them. We didn't realize that these examples of integrity were the most valuable things that we had in our traditional story of life. So we start out to try to find the way to a personal integration in a confused and problemed planet. Actually, it is not a terrible thing. Everything that is right is finally highly rewarded by its own realities. Reality never punishes. Reality can only stand and wait until it is deserved. So we have no need to fear that if we improve, we're going to be desolated by improvement. We will not be desolated unless the attachments and values we hold in life are so false in themselves that we consider the loss of them to be the supreme tragedy. If the things that we are doing wrong and the attitudes that we are holding that are not reasonable are so delightful to us that we refuse to give them up, then we will have to do what the ancients showed in their art. It shows us They showed us disappearing, holding these things in hand and vanishing with them. Today we have a, a much better concept of some of these values, and right at this time it is very important, I think, for us to recognize the challenge of Easter, the challenge of the resurrection of right, the coming forth of right out of the darkness of death, the coming forth of eternal life from the Holy Sepulchre. The Holy Sepulchre is the world. It is the earth and all that it inhabits. It is our own bodies, our own hearts, our own minds, our own communities, our own home. Every one of these structures, now tottering, now actually graves rather than palaces, all of these structures are waiting patiently for justification so that they can rise victoriously over selfishness, superstition, and crime. And we can start in a little simple way in our own lives. We all have problems every day. And in these problems, we must seek after righteousness. We must also take this basic attitude to try to understand what the universe wants us to do when we are faced with a very important decision. How can we do it for the good of that which is right? How can we make the problem of living part of a program for the releasing of the human soul from bondage to ignorance, superstition, and fear? We can start in what, by reevaluating some of our own problems, looking around to see a society in which the world is moving toward a universal brotherhood, rather than building barrier after barrier to prevent mankind's natural growth and happiness. Those who do not have enough are unhappy. Those who have too much are unhappy. And those who have what they need only are very ambitious to improve the situation. 
So when uh, our whole civilization, as we know it, has been built around, gradually around, the idea of the infinite significance of luxury, of actual competitive structure, and scientists who should know better, economists who certainly do know better, and politicians whose knowledge is very dubious, all these people are involved in this. There are very few people that cannot face certain facts with a major amount of thoughtfulness. We know that if we go on at the present time, we're going to exhaust all the resources of nature, and we are hoping that by that time we will devise some new source of researches and resources until finally we go on to inevitable oblivion. Actually, our materialistic science, our world, regardless of its in fact, the two-thirds of it is religion-oriented. The world, basically, is atheistic. Atheism in the sense that it ignores principles while claiming to believe them, that affirms the reality of God and pays no attention to the Ten Commandments. This type of thinking is, must be considered lack of righteousness. Now, I know in, we work a lot with people in their problems. And the lack of righteousness is a basis of sickness. If the individual eats the wrong food long enough, he's going to destroy his health. If he decides to go into narcotics, he's going to destroy his health quicker. If he is deciding to go on in the way he has been thinking from, the, from childhood to now, and depending entirely upon authority outside of himself for instruction, he will go right on getting into the same troubles that he's now in, and probably worse ones. Actually, the individual has to do a little thinking about all this. He has to do what every scientist ought to do, and that is have proof that his mistakes are helpful, and this he can't do. He can never prove that being wrong is right. And the fact that all people are wrong doesn't make one bit righter. <laughs> If the individual, by like science with its researching capacities, as, as studies the problems of living as it studies molecules, it would soon show us that there is a moral universe which is just as real and just as susceptible to scientific rules as the physical one. We are just simply overlooking the disagreeable facts which might force us to improve conduct. We do not really want to be better. We talk about it, but down, or down inside, what we want is a larger home and a swimming pool. <laughs> uh, we hope we can get it honestly. We are very unhappy at the government for taxing us with questionable responsibilities. We believe we should be free from all of these burdens. But what do we do to solve these burden, burdens in our own thinking? A person who is in trouble, after a little while, begins to develop mental difficulties. Now, there are a great many people wandering around the earth in almost every level of society who are not actually insane, but they are intensely neurotic. <laughs> and neurosis becomes a terrible detriment to character. Neurosis allows the mind to take in food that is poisonous. It does the same thing with the mental and emotional life that we think of in junk calories. The uh, neurotic individual gradually develops all kinds of attitudes. Some neurotics go into religion intensively, develop all kinds of psychic experiences and try to live by them. Most of these people are in trouble. Others simply declare themselves to be basing their lives upon some kind of a philosophy like Marx or Engels, and they are in trouble, like the countries that are trying to live by them now. Everyone is in trouble because they have not recognized that honesty is the basis of survival. Honesty interferes with a quick profit. But when everyone thinks of nothing but a quick profit, humanity collapses. It just isn't built that way. Absolutely uh, true in nature is everything has use. 
right use develops and, and protects and evolves. Wrong use we call abuse, and wherever it exists, it is a disease. And it is something that gradually becomes a communicatable disease, an infectious disease, and finally destroys the fabric of a complete nation or a complete generation of people. So this morning we will want to try to think a little bit about what Easter really suggests to us. First of all, it is a statement for millions of millions, hundreds of millions of Christians of the hope of resurrection. It is the final internal experience or acceptance of the victory of the divine over the human. It is the final statement that while the body is temporal and impermanent, the dweller in the flesh is eternal. And it is this rising of the self over the illusions of existence, the release of the inner life from slavery to appetites and ambitions, the resurrection of realities, of integrities, and of the final spiritual rules which govern all things. The world is a theocracy no matter how we're going to approach it, and materialism is nothing but a handmaiden which if properly used will make life more comfortable and pleasant, but if it takes over the authority of the living ends a war, revolution, and destruction. This type of concept then would be uh, more or less suitable to this season. This is the season of the vernal equinox. This is the promised return of the sovereign sun to bring light and peace to the earth. And as the sun shines upon the earth, so the spiritual light of truth shines in the hearts and lives of those who are willing to open themselves to ways of thinking and living that are superior to the ones that are getting them into trouble. So we can start out more or less as individuals to see what we can do as persons uh, to improve the general structure of our society. And the good seed is not lost. And the good seed also grows and bears many fruit. But each individual in his own life has to sow this mustard seed, which is to become a great tree. And it begins with a new attitude toward the way we live, an attitude in which, above all the domination and dictatorship of institutions, whether spiritual or political or industrial, uh, that above all of these is an intimate personal experience of deity. The, the God in us is more important than anything in the world outside. And each individual having this divine power in himself and the right to live according to it and the, and the right to release conduct is by means of this inspiration. These are things that belong to the new age, the coming world which we all hope for. Utopia is nothing more or less than letting the best in us mingle with the best in all others in a common brotherhood. And until that happens, there is no answer. There are no amounts of armament that can protect us. There are no amount of legislation that can remove our problems. There are no, many, no strikes, violence, revolutions, rebellions, or anarchies that will solve anything that can be solved only by the life of enlightened love. There can be no other way. And in emergencies, we realize this. But when the emergency passes, we drop back into the convenient ways of doing everything as easily and painlessly as possible. And as a result of that, the more painless it becomes, the more impossible and painful it will ultimately be. Now on the word also of uh, uh, the idea that we have here of righteousness, supposing we try to define righteousness in terms of social significance, of social order. What are the problems that we face? Well, we can take a very simple example, perhaps, from the computerizing processes. If we turn the computer upon the problem of righteousness, if we develop the necessary machinery that will tell us the truth about what we have been lying to ourselves about for ages, 
something good might come out of it. We might learn what no one seems to be willing to know at the present time, that all the problems, mistakes, and delinquencies of the human being can be estimated. The consequences of them can be scientifically demonstrated, and we can be, live in a world in which the truth is available to all of us in the sense that keep the rules and we will survive. Now the rules, as we say, are not always easy to, to work with. But we have another factor inside of ourselves that is helpful in this matter, and that is conscience. There is nearly always inside of us that still small voice which because of our mistakes has become stiller and smaller in every generation. We do know in our hearts when we are not doing well. When we lose our temper, when we begin to blame, blame other people, we can talk ourselves and do anything we want to. But somewhere down in the depths of our own lives and through the experiences of living which we have already passed through, there comes a realization that we are taking a bad chance, that we are very likely going to suffer as a result of a misdeed, that we're going to pay for cruelty, unkindness, and the failure to cooperate in proper and reasonable manners. This is going to get us into trouble. We know this. Somehow we sense it. Therefore, we also feel bad. We feel badly. We feel discouraged when things go wrong. When we lose a friend, we regret it. And even if we know that we are the cause of the loss, we are satisfying ourselves that because the friend has embarrassed us or disappointed us in some manner, but inside we know there was a mistake in it somewhere. That we do not lose friends unless there's something wrong with ourselves. And these broken homes, there's something wrong in those people. But it's something that one or both have not been able to control. And yet they know in their own hearts that they shouldn't be in that trouble. But the trouble is easier than the solution. And the trouble is, is solved by evasion, avoidance, or escape. Where a problem becomes difficult, we try to walk out of it. When reality, we should work out of it. Every problem is a challenge to reestablish righteousness in our own hearts and minds. It is something that we should face with diligence and should place the common good of solution above all other considerations. But we do not have the moral courage under temptation to make these decisions. Now, uh, what is temptation? Of course, in the old days, temptation was a gentleman with horns and a forked tail who was supposed to be hiding behind every doorpost in the world. Many people were afraid to go out at night because this fork-tailed monster was waiting. Now we're afraid to go out at night for some reason why our neighbors will rob us. It's a still fear, and fear and mistakes and inability to cure our own difficulties. All this continue, all these things continue to depress us, frighten us, and worry us. But actually, we are not in this serious a condition. We are simply in a condition where we really do not know what happiness is. And in the course of years, of course, I have known a great many people who have very large material holdings. I don't think there's one of them that would tell you honestly and quietly that the holdings had made him happy. They do not make people happy. They add to the burdens of life. And in the desperate desire to hold on to something, which we can't take with us anyway, we destroy the pleasure, happiness, and usefulness of a present existence. So the problem of getting away from happiness that results from wrong conduct or compromise of principles is something we have to face. The justification of that which is unjust. And as we try to do this, the world gets into deeper troubles every day. Actually, we note now, for the first time in a long while, a rather interesting and constructive symptom appearing. 
We are beginning to recognize the rights of people to think their own thoughts, particularly in matters of philosophy, morality, ethics, and religion. The tendency today in religion is to recognize, as we must do, that religion, wherever we find it, is a priceless asset. Religion is something upon which we must all try to build international relationships, because on no other level can we really reach people. Today, we go into a nation and try to industrialize it, and something happens as happened in India recently, a great disaster. Actually, there are disasters always of one kind or another, strikes or unemployment or disease, wherever we attempt to create relationships by material considerations alone, where we try to build treaties upon industrial advantages, or where we try to create international goodwill by paying somebody else's bills. All of these things end in trouble. But as long as the individual alone uh, realizes this, it's very difficult to work with. But now more people are realizing this every day. And the religious atmosphere is much clearer than it was not too many years ago. A kind of interesting little note came along. I take a little newspaper that is sent out by the government of Taipei. And then in this particular issue, we find the so-called free China, uh, also in a little trouble. And what would you suppose that trouble is? The government of Taiwan has decided to build a 40-foot bronze statue of Confucius. This is because to these people, Confucius is a very important figure of integrities. And uh, his integrities, as represented in the dialects and so forth, are among the highest, I guess, of any religion or philo philosophical system. So free China wants to honor him. And they want to build that 40-foot statue on a promontory in a public area which had been reserved uh, and which is more or less like a large park. Now, what happens? The bulletin is hardly out before the objections are organized. And on this little island with a few people, most of whom are very, very receptive to Confucius, they're already in trouble over trying to build a statue of him. One group says that there's only one likeness of him that is authentic. And the problem is, if they do not use this likeness, it's all going to be wrong. Another group says that it is uh, being placed in a public arrangement or a place which is a public property, therefore should not be used for any purpose except a park. One after another, these groups are going to organize. They are going to probably uh, keep on uh, objecting. They may uh, have formed strikes and things of this kind to prove their end. But the problem of the wisdom of Confucius has suddenly gotten lost. No one has really said that the ideals of Confucianism are the things that are important. The problem of the 40-foot bronze statue is liable to tear a nation apart in, honors, in, effort, in an effort to honor a person who gave them the principles of brotherhood, cooperation, and mutual insight and virtue. So the, uh, the virtues of Confucianism are not strong enough to prevent a strike over his statue. <laughs> now, we do this all the time. All over the world, we build churches, but people go to them, support them, and build them. But somehow... Three, probably three and a half to four billion religion-oriented persons have no influence whatever in trying to prevent a nuclear war. Most of the persons who are working in armament are nominally religious people in private life. They believe in integrities and they would like to serve them. But for some reason there's always a reason why they can't. And the reason is now largely economic. It is also political. And, of course, continues in the conflicts between religious beliefs. All of which comes back to Easter, in which we are prevent presented with the symbol of the resurrection of truth, the resurrection of love and beauty, as the savior of all that lives. 
that integrities are important. Righteousness comes first. We must first have righteousness, and then all else that is necessary will be given unto us. But the righteousness is where the rub is, where the difficulties are accumulating. The whole trend of our modern world is not in the direction of righteousness. It is in the direction of the satisfaction of personal appetites on every level. But there's one other factor that we are beginning to recognize, and that is we're getting to be a little afraid. Fear is coming in. Fear is showing us every day that all immoderation is dangerous. Fear is showing us that if we keep on going the way we are now, we're going to be in more and more serious difficulty. And in that way, laws, universal laws, affirm themselves and assert themselves. The question now remains is how much, much longer are we going to make willfully uh, uh, posited mistakes before we catch up with the facts? Many people feel that the time has really come now when we are beginning to catch up with the facts, that little by little uh, it is becoming apparent to those on every level of thinking that the only answer to the whole situation is honesty. And that has been a terrible, terrible discovery. It has just ruined lives, which were built entirely upon selfishness. So in some way or other, righteousness is the cure for selfishness. It is the cure for those unreasonable ambitions which cause the individual to, to attain his success by destroying the rights of other people. This, this is the, the fact Watch the situation as it unfolds, and it beca it's becoming more and more evident that all the panaceas, all the remedies, all the vast conferences are not going to amount to much of anything unless people settle down to liking each other. The more you know people, the better you like most of them. But while you are an, uh, a stranger to two-thirds or three-quarters of the world, you have a difficulty there. We had that difficulty for a long time religiously. Uh, we knew practically nothing about any religion except our own. We had about a billion people uh, of our general persuasion, and the other three and a half or four billion didn't count. They had, we, their religion was heathenism. We were the ones that had the true religion. Well, that would have been fine if we had lived it. If we had daily and honestly accomplish the works of a great religion, we have always had the strength to do it. But gradually the religion was lost. A theology took its place, and in the life of the individual, profit overcame the whole thing. So out of all of this problem, we have to recognize the need for the gradual realization that nature is moving in. We are living on a restricted planet. It has only a certain amount of potential. We can waste it or conserve it. If we waste it, we'll regret it. If we conserve it, we can do many things. We are living under a system of thought and an economic policy that has nothing in it that is of permanent value. Every conclusion on these levels that has been made in the past has proven false in something and finally been renounced. We are here living on a shallow surface of thinking with no actual recognition of the ways to perpetuate and preserve the values that we have. We are destroying our forests, we are destroying our agriculture, we are polluting our air and water, and we're going on gloriously digging our own graves. It's time to stop. <clears throat> it is not necessary. It is not necessary because the human values never demanded it, realized it, or needed it. And this is the problem that has to come gradually out of ourselves. <clears throat> we have to develop a real affection for humanity. We have to be thoughtful of our neighbor. We have to be, raise children properly instead of forgetting them while we go out and do as we please. We're going to have to get over all of the selfishness that hurts. Now, supposing we do neglect children for a few years, and we do get to go out and have more club life or get longer vacations, 
Then comes the time when we have to live with these uncivilized children that we have neglected, and in, on, and in recognition of a few years of fun, we end up with delinquent young people who will worry us the rest of our lives. And we are not at all willing to accept our own responsibility for it. Out of the proper doing of things, there is a happiness, a fulfillment, a sincere joy that comes only when we do it right. And that joy isn't subject to sudden upheavals. It isn't subject to being swept away. Because dedication can be tested, and sometimes seriously. But if we can stay with it, it will win and we will win. So the uh, whole problem, it seems to me, that uh, should be recognized in connection with Easter is that it's getting to be high time that the magnificent traditions of our, of our world can be put to practical, actual application. That we will no longer be members of things, but we will be workers with things. That we will not call ourselves by a religious name, but we will so live that that religion will reveal itself through our conduct and through our dedications. It is important, therefore, very important at this time in our history to realize that we are in a transitional period. This is really a new birth of time that we are talking about. The thing has reached an impasse, an impasse that has been building up for 10,000 years, <clears throat> an impasse that will not go away, an impasse that demands a change in the basic structure of human society, a change in which integrities and values have first consideration. It has to be a matter in which the private uh, profits of people can no longer be sustained by a world the natural resources of which are diminishing daily. It is not going to be possible to forever make fortunes in oil or fortunes in any field. It will not be possible to maintain elaborate armament programs forever because the very life of things is being destroyed. And just as the individual who is in bad trouble, who perhaps has been a chronic alcoholic, finding delirium tremens have settled in and not knowing what to do, goes to a physician and says, what uh, shall I do? I'm in a desperate condition. The Buddha had a fable relating to this that was very, very good, very valuable, in which he was the physician. And he came to them, the people who were sick and those who took the medicine, which was bitter, lived and recovered, and those who did not take the medicine died or remained as they were. And uh, the only attitude, Buddha said, is discipline the mind, redeem and regenerate conduct, and dedicate life to service. These are the things that go on and will make, ultimately, a paradise on earth. There is no reason why a, be, a people a well educated but badly taught should not be able to dwell together there is no reason why the stranger must be always an enemy he may be a friend in disguise or a friend we have never seen there is no reason why competition is going to add to the fulfillment of our desire to help emerging countries all things which in themselves have the seeds of death will never in the long run result in any harvest except death. All of the things that are valuable are intangibles. They are in principles, not in uh, the accumulation. It's not going to help much to educate people if education teaches them only to destroy each other. I think the educational system, as it was reviewed and revised by Comenius, the uh, Moravian educator, was very good. Education is, first of all, to learn. And what is learning? Learning is rather more than anything else. The gradual learning to know life, know truth, know God, and develop the strength to resist temptation. A religion without morality is merely a strange, complicated form of ignorance. It is not true intelligence. No amount of education that is wrong 
can produce graduates that are essentially right. The only answer to this type of education in the past has been very simple, as a well-known doctor observed on one occasion. He graduated from medical school with honors and then started at the bottom and worked up in his own practice because he had to learn everything over again. They had failed to teach him the things he needed most to know, one of which was charity and compassion for the sick. These things are very different from science, but they are far more important than science. Compassion without science will survive. Science without compassion is doomed. All of the good things of life are principles that are resident in life itself and visible in every manifestation of life. How it is possible for persons to claim or believe that they are learned and skilled and progressive and at the same time have ignored completely the moral life upon which we all depend. How this can be called education is difficult to realize. It is also difficult for us to understand how it happens that all the resources of life are being devoted almost completely to the perpetuation of something that must fail. And as Woodrow Wilson pointed out on one occasion, occasion speaking of it as it is now, he said it is better to fail in something that must ultimately succeed than to succeed in something that must ultimately fail. And we are in this position. We are trying to succeed in something that must ultimately fail. And the only thing that we have to protect us is a spark of life inside and the mass of these sparks making a world around us and within us. The spark of reality that is eternal within our own inner core and within the great universal system to which we belong and the annual resurrection of which is represented by the symbolism of Easter. Easter is a statement that beyond all human control is a rule and that you shall love one another. And we've laughed at it, we've ignored it, we've considered it to be uh, impractical and unreasonable. But it is still true that the law of love is the most important thing in the world. And this love is not a physical emotion. The physical aspects of it belong with the left hand, honors and riches. But the right hand is length of life and depth of insight. And love is really the compassion that is natural to us to recognize that we are one being, one creature, manifesting through an infinitude of individuals, but always one. And that that one cannot have sickness anywhere in it without the whole body becoming sick. Therefore, each Easter now, we've got to keep on selling these ideas. Not because they're ours, not because we have control of them, not because we can prove them by uh, certain examples which we do not understand, but by something else that we know them, and that is by the internal realization of the way of life. In other words, it is the righteousness in us that is able to protect the righteousness in the world. It is the presence of God in ourselves that proves beyond all question the reality of divinity. It is the very fact that's out of the little bits of matter that we call bodies that come these magnificent organisms, organisms as vast as great animals, as tiny as little cells, all alive, and all alive because of one life, and all naturally bestowed life, be bringing with it the proof that all this bestowing is because the infinite life so loves its creation that it sends its redeemer to us. And all of the love in ourselves bears witness to a love of something greater than ourselves. And it is not the failure of our sciences or our arts, but the fact that we have stripped them of the natural affections that are necessary. We feel that these affections will interfere with profit, that they will result in unemployment. They will not result in unemployment. Selfishness is the cause of unemployment. 
and we must work to overcome these things. We must educate for good and not for profit. We must try to bring nations out of their own infancy, not into our way of life, but into a way of life greater than ours. Each, we hope that each generation that comes from ourselves will be a little better. It is also true that we hope that every nation that emerges out of the mystery of disorganization is going to be a little better. That each country will learn something from our mistakes. We'll learn to keep faith. We'll learn to overcome the selfishness and pride and ambition and militarism that has distinguished and, dif and dismantled society from the beginning. We hope all these are going to be better people than we are. We hope that all things are like what the Indian sage once said, who is quoted in one of the early sacred books, that it is the hope and divine aspiration of the guru or teacher, that he shall live to see one of his disciples excel him in all ways. And we as a nation should be living to watch other nations excel us in values not in locking ourselves in a competition that's going to end in a trade war, but uniting us all in a code of preservation by which we will cheerfully reunite with all others to protect our survival, to protect the happiness of our people, to protect the divine laws that are being manifested, and to contribute to the eternal evolution of life on this planet and in worlds to come. All these things should be our recognition. The great experiment of Penn, the holy experiment, is one that we are now faced with. The experiment of creating a new definition of the world. The world as infinite opportunity, but also a world that must be guarded by appropriate value of responsibility. We are here to be, make a better world, not to make richer people. We are here to make certain that the values of life come to their normal and proper ends because this is the only way we should ever know happiness. Happiness is not going to come from what we have. It's going to come from what we are. It is going to come from the internal realization that we have done a good job, that we have fulfilled the rules of life that we are supposed to fulfill, that we have kept the faith, and that we have therefore come into a security which is beyond human estimation. We don't know what happiness is. What we commonly call happiness is a kind of marginal contentment. It is ability to accept things as they are as better than they might be or worse than they should be. All these things uh, are not happiness. There can be no happiness for a real human being in a world that is in misery. There is no way in which the one individual all by themselves can attain all good things while others are deprived of everything. This is not a matter of socialism. This is not a matter of uh, political structure. It is a matter that we are controlled by a complete deism. We are controlled not by an economic policy but by a divine power. And that this divine power is the final arbiter of all things. The final arbitrator of life. The final source of authority, and that this authority has cleared itself, revealed itself, and is showing itself every moment in the magnificent structure of creation as we see it, a world that we are disfiguring and decimating without necessarily accomplishing any good or happiness for ourselves, a world which with proper integration and organization will not only produce a completely secure civilization, but will free us for the more valuable things of life. We will free us for contemplation of values. It will free us to enrich our philosophy of living, to come into a greater and fuller sense of internal integrities. It will give us the sense of safety which we have lost, because we can never be safe while half the world is ignorant. All these things have to be worked out in a spirit not of material uh, enforcements, not a policing of man's faults, but a building and developing of the eternal virtues of existence. And this is the second coming, in my mind, of the divine power. When it comes to us in an emergency, when we have, when it has come after we have denied it, 
three times or many times that we have sacrificed it for values that were valueless in eternity that we have compromised our divine heritage for a bowl of pottage all these things we have to sometime come to know and out of the knowing of these things we do have the beginning of the holy experiment of eternal brotherhood and it is not only now due but the need of it is pressing in on us every moment 500 years ago we never knew these things a hundred years ago they didn't matter much but now as po problems increase populations increase natural resources diminish and the struggle to maintain a false world becomes more and more bitter with millions of so-called innocent people dying for the preservation of arrogance and ignorance this type of thing cannot go on it was not intended to go on but it is true and we must face it that we were here to learn and as Bottom says in Midsummer Night's Dream we have been slow of learning we have not done the thing that we should have done we have continued to try to force our own ambitions as the fulfillment of the divine plan we have created theologies in which our gods were as selfish as ourselves we have gone through every type of misunderstanding and misinterpreting that is imaginable and here we are with all our lore fools no wiser than before and this we have to take care of and uh, Easter is a wonderful time to kind of think this through gain a new sense of integrities re reinstate our dedications and uh, turn the authority of, over to, uh, of our lives to that dweller in the heart which is our true life that we shall no longer depend upon the mind to save us or the hand to enrich us but that the hand and the mind and the heart must be always in service to the keeper of life the divine power that abides within each of us and is always the hope of glory for it is this divinity in ourselves that is going to keep right on to being divine and we are going to discover it only when we live according to its rules we will find in the uniting our own effort with the divine plan as it is even etched in our own bodies we're going to find a happiness we've never known before we're going to discover what it means to live in a world in which there is no longer worry over what is wrong but rather there is a newer and greater rejoicing over what is right this has to come and as uh, many people are beginning to see today it's not a discouraging problem it is not a hopeless matter it is not something that can go on and ever generation after generation and we pass it on as a worthless heritage to our issues it is not this at all it is something that is coming to a gradually to the realization that life is more important than death that right is better than wrong the truth is better than error and that all the good things the happiness we want the real enlightenment the real righteousness with which we are concerned is available to us and is going to come and that one by one we are going to gain it because we are going to find that all else fails and nothing stands nothing survives and nothing endures but that which is according to the divine purpose and the divine plan and as long as that purpose is present we are safe and that purpose is visible to us every day we live it is pur this purpose is visible in every certainty of science in every dream of philosophy every prayer of religion it's here and always has been but we've never been true to it but one thing we can know that regardless of how we live or how we, how we think truth is going to be true to us and we're going to find ways gradually of fulfilling the magnificent destiny for which we were intended and which is inevitable to us in spite of all the mistakes we choose to make it's coming and one of these days with Easter will be representing a, reg a restoration of the divine plan in the world of human beings thank you Thank you.